Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning and see we have many here but also many out so we kind of evened out a little bit. You have probably heard while well ago my daughter proudly knows her ABCs <laughs> and so she's, uh, she's not afraid to sing at any time. I might even say that even last night when we came home it was probably about 5 30 6 o'clock and she had fell asleep early and about 12 30 last night she woke up came to our bed and uh, laid down and as she was laying there you know just it kind of woke me up a little bit but not much and as she was laying there she just all of a sudden decided to yell out peekaboo <laughs> so, and she said it twice and then she talked for about an hour so anyway but you know we we manage and uh we we love her to death so anyway just thought i'd share that if you are a uh star wars fan kind of like i am you would recognize this phrase and also who said it do not underestimate the power of the force i'm sure we all know who said that so this morning i tell I titled this lesson, Do Not Underestimate the Power of Sin. So that's what I'm going to be talking about here this morning. You know, too often times, <clears throat> we tend to underestimate the power, the nature, and the consequences that sin has. Uh, people in this world, they treat sin uh, as something, they look at sin as something pleasurable or... Uh, something fun or satisfying and they'll just say you know this is just the way life is it's just full of sin you know just accept it and so society has become desensitized to sin in a lot of ways and thankful to a lot of resources such as you know uh, movies today tv shows and the media outlets uh, they're you know they're not helping things as far as that goes but god has made it very clear that he wants us to understand the destructive nature that uh, sin has. <clears throat> and so today what I want to do is, uh, take a, is for us to consider this morning taking a much closer look at really how powerful sin is. So what, first of all, you know, what does the Bible have to say about sin? Well, we know what the Bible says what sin is in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Uh, you know that verse there where it says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And so sin, since sin is uh, lawlessness, you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 23, when he, those who do practice lawlessness, those are the ones that he said, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so sin, you know, being lawlessness... Uh, you know, that, that's going to not be good on the day of judgment. So we think about, you know, you might think about how easy it is to, for one human being to be able to kill another. And they can take their life just so easy. But sin also, it has the power to kill the soul. Uh, in Ezekiel 18, verse 4 the Bible says there, the soul that sins shall surely die. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, you know, Paul said there that the wages of sin is death. In uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, he says here that all unrighteousness is sin. And also in Isaiah, chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, we see what sin can do right here, where Isaiah says there, Behold, the Lord's hand is not too short that it cannot save, nor is his ear too heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you uh, from your God, where he, is, he cannot hear you. And so sin, we can see it is a very destructive thing. And if it separates us from our God, you remember what uh, the Hebrew writer said in chapter 10 and verse 27, where he said there, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So 
what effect does sin, uh, does sin have on man? Uh, also in the, in the book of Hebrews, there in chapter 12, verse 1, it mentions there how sin so easily ensnares us. And uh, when it ensnares us, we see how it goes about doing that in James chapter 1 and verse 14. If you want to turn your Bibles there, James chapter 1, verse 14, we see the process here. Where it says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So each sin has a desire. And, you know, each there's a desire out there that appeals to each person. Uh, you know, what might seem pleasurable to me may not seem pleasurable to you. What seems pleasurable to you may not seem pleasurable to me. And so, let's say, for example, uh, we see a person sees something that they want, and that right there has got their attention. You know, whatever that object is, you might be thinking about the, the one thing that you want the most, but that you don't have. Seeing that object, that now that it has your attention, and you know that uh, you can't afford it, but you want it so bad, you're even going as far as considering the possibility of, you know, stealing it. And so desiring that satisfaction of having that object, so it prompts us to sin to go get it. And so sin, it has drawn that person away, but once it is committed, you know, that person is now trapped, or as a Hebrew writer said, ensnared or hooked. And I kind of think about the illustration of... Uh, you know, like if it, any of you went out fishing, you know, you think about how uh, when you're fishing for a certain kind of fish, uh, you use a certain kind of lure. There's a certain kind of lure that appeals to a certain kind of fish. And when a fish sees that lure, well, it's going to, it's, it's enticed, it wants to go after it, and it'll go get it, and next thing you know, it's unhooked. It's ensnared. And so it, you know, sin has the same effect on uh, human beings. And so as Christians, you know, we're to stay away from those places and those things that can so easily ensnare us. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, he said, Do not give place, or some translations will say, do not give opportunity to the devil. So once sin has you, it then it makes you a slave. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 but right here, Paul says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? And so once sin has us, it, you know, it's going to do its best to keep us. So what is the cost of sin? Let's, I wanna, let's consider for a moment... Um, you know, your land that you have, everything that you possess. Now, go beyond that. You've traveled, uh, you traveled to some places far away, and you kind of get an idea how big the earth is, all the things that are in it, how far it goes, its uh, wide uh, spans and everything. And, you know, you've seen all different kinds of lands. You've seen the ocean, uh, states, countries, um, you think about all the money, the gold, the machinery, everything on the, everything on this planet. You try, have you ever tried to figure out what it, this whole planet is worth? I looked it up, and it this planet they estimate uh, the planet Earth to be worth about five quadrillion dollars. You know, and you know that's just a little bit of money there. Um, you know, for a quadrillion, that's a you know that would be a the number five with about 15 zeros behind it. So that's, you know, that's quite a bit. But when we consider how much this planet is worth, do you realize and understand that you do own a possession that is far greater than that? And this is for real. You do own something that is much more valuable uh, than five quadrillion dollars, and it's within your possession. So... What, uh, 
What to us is the price tag for our soul? Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, in verse 36, Mark chapter 8, verse 36, he says here, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So if you were about to lose your soul and you did own the whole planet, you'd be ready to give it up in a heartbeat. So we kind of see how the worth of what our soul is and the price of what sin is. Our soul's value is far beyond what this planet can ever afford. Um, the whole thing and everything in it. So who are you going to commit this soul to that you own, that you possess? Are you going to commit it to God or do we just let it go to Satan? Um, you know, with God... If we commit our souls to God, you think about what happens to our soul then. Our soul is going to increase, I can't think of a number big enough, so I would say eternity fold. It's going to increase a whole lot more than what, uh, like what we can place a value on, which we can place a value on it. But if we commit it to Satan, then it is going to be a total loss. Sin, it has the highest cost known to man. It costs us probably a lot more than what we think about. You know, when we think of sin, like I said in the beginning, we might kind of take it for granted, may not think much about it, but it has an extremely high cost. In fact, there is no cost that costs more than what sin does. And sin can afford to purchase your very soul. And not just your soul, but many souls. <clears throat> and so whoever, whoever chooses to be enslaved by sin, uh, it's got the power to buy your soul. Again, in Romans chapter 6, and verse 23, where we see the wages of sin is death. And what he's talking about here, not so much a physical death, but the spiritual death. So we see the wages for sin, it has an extremely high cost. Now, it will not only cost us spiritually, but sin is going to really work hard on securing its investment. Once it has you, <clears throat> it's going to do its best uh, to become, you might say, the CEO of your physical life. It is going to do all it can. It's going to probably invest in your soul uh, in order to keep it. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15, Proverbs 13 and verse 15, it says, But the way of the unfaithful is hard. So a person who is living unfaithful in this life, it is hard. Hard. So, how does sin go about doing this? How does it go about securing its investment into your soul? The way it does this is by not completely fulfilling uh, the desires in this physical life. Uh, it's going to always leave you hanging and wanting more to the point to where you're going to want more of it. You're going to need more of it. Uh, sin, it's always going to it will always give you under the amount that you are desiring at the point, at that time. It's never ever going to give, give you the amount that you want if you're considering sin. So what makes sins, uh, I'm trying to think here. Um, we see the worth of sin uh, by the Hebrew writer again in Hebrews 11 and verse 25 where there it talked about Moses, how it said that he would rather suffer uh, the, what his people were suffering rather than enjoy the uh, passing pleasures of sin. And so sin, it, you know, it's kind of like an addictive drug here. Uh, once you get your first fix, you're, you really like it, you're going to want some more of it. And so you can't, you're going to always be looking for your next fix. And so you're going to keep on seeking more and more intensely every time uh, when you seek for it. And you're always going to try to get your uh, fill. You're always going to try to get to that, say, that fill mark. But you know what they say about sin? Sin is missing the mark. It's always going to give you just under uh, what you're seeking. Uh, Moses here in this verse in Hebrews 11.25, when it said that he would rather suffer the, uh, what his people are suffering, 
that goes to show there's more value in suffering uh, than what sin has to offer in this life. Suffering the afflictions in this life uh, really has a lot more value than what sin can ever offer. And we don't really think about that because we think about sin being such a bad thing. You know, we don't want to have to suffer at all. But really, suffer does have a lot of a lot of value. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But even if you should suffer for, righteous, for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. So suffering, we are a lot more blessed than what we would be if we uh, chose to sin. So sin's first order of business is going to be what you might would say, it's going to try to censor your conscience. It's going to try to uh, stop its opposition against it. That's its first order of business once you have sinned. Uh, we've, we've read in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 2 where it talks about having your conscience seared with a hot iron. And that's what sin is going to seek to do. It's going to seek to silence, to censor, and stop its opposition, which, is, uh, your, which would first be your conscience. So let's say something like alcohol, uh, for example. You know, once a person drinks alcohol, well, they may have fun with it or something. They may thought it was enjoyable. But we understand that alcohol is very, can be very, very addictive. In fact, the uh, proverb writer says in chapter 20, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So don't be led astray by alcohol. Also, uh, turn over a few pages to uh, chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23, starting in verse 31. <clears throat> Proverbs 23 and 31. It says, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, at the last, it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like the one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? And, you know, we could say the same thing, not only with alcohol, but same thing with drugs, even pornography for that matter. Um, bad language, uh, hate. That, we engage in those types of sins, and we might, if we were to find satisfaction in that, then sin has now found its place in our soul, and it's going to work on securing its investment like I said, by first silencing our conscience. Uh, we've seen where, you know, sin, the destructive nature of sin, how many marriages it has wrecked, uh, families who have children, or, well, I was, yeah, family, you know, people who've had children out of wedlock, they're born into this world with a home that is already broken and torn apart. Uh, but now for the unmarried, you know, uh, who would desire to have sexual pleasures, uh, you know, that, as the Bible says, is meant for those who are married. Um, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, where it said there that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But we see that even the sins of uh, sexual sins, uh, the destructive nature that they have and the consequences they have. You know, they can bring things like AIDS, uh, STDs, and, um, you know, it's just, it'll sin, almost any kind of sin will try to get you hooked on it. I also might say it's kind of like sugar. You know, you eat some sugar, uh, what are you going to want? You're going to keep wanting more of it. And yeah, I kind of think, to me, I kind of think of like sugar as kind of like a drug too. It kind of acts like a drug. Uh, not saying wrong to have sugar, but you know, having uh, so much sugar, you're always going to be craving uh, more, more of it. So, sin will also deceive us if we let it. Its nature is to deceive us. In James chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, Do not be deceived. My brethren, do not be deceived. 
So man, he uh, deceives himself when he tries to deal with sin uh, with, his own meth- with his own methods. Uh, let's say, for instance, like uh, denial. You know what the, you know, the Bible says in 1 John uh, chapter 1 and verse 10 where it says if we say we have no sin, then his, tr- his word is not in us and you know, we do not have the truth. Another way in which man tries to handle sin his way might would be to conceal it. He tries to conceal his sin. Uh, the proverb writer says in uh, chapter 28, in verse 13, 28, 13, it says, He who covers his sins will not prosper. You remember the story of what happened to uh, David and Bathsheba? What happened there? Whenever uh, David had committed that sin with Bathsheba and then he tried to cover it up, that just led to more and more sin and more and more destruction, uh, more consequences. And so, you know, it it never does end good. Another way in which uh, man tries to probably deal with sin in his own way, he might try to redefine, uh, redefine what he's doing or, or what it is. You know, such as like, things such as like pornography, well, that's considered adult literature. Or uh, drunkenness, you know, well, it's just alcoholism. Uh, trying to, you know, kind of make it not sound so bad. Uh, also, you, you've heard of this, uh, an unborn baby, it, it's just a fetus. It has no life, it's just a fetus, it's just more of a thing. So, man, uh, people today try to redefine uh, way, uh, the sins that they commit. Another way would be a rationalization, if I said that correctly. Rationalization. You know, which that there is a mental process of trying to justify our actions. Um, you know, it was just that one time. It's no big deal. We don't, you know, try not to think much about it. Just try to rationalize your way out of it. Another way in which man tries to handle sin will be legalization. Uh, you know, he probably looks at a different source of authority, like the civil laws. Uh, you know, civil laws trying to justify their sin. Uh, if it goes against with what the Bible says, you know, for instance, like a, you know, a woman divorcing her husband for any reason, you know, in civil law, it's going to let you do it, and it's not going to think anything about it, but, you know, we know what the Bible says. <clears throat> Another method would be substitution. A person basically just, you know, pretty much goes out uh, uh, wanting to just send all they want, but as long as they come back on Sunday, uh try to, you know, act like they repent and then ask for forgiveness and then they, you know, go about and do it again. So they just try to substitute it each Sunday with, uh, you know, just trying to claim they're getting forgiveness. As long as they go back on Sunday, well, then everything resets. Um, ra- you know, rather we are to, as what uh, Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter 10, Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse... Four. where he says here for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and so when we first had that idea of sin, you know, when it tries to entice us, we have it in our mind, but we need to bring every thought into uh, captivity. So we see the way that man tries to deal with sin himself in his own methods, it's just not going to work. Uh, sin's just going to keep coming back and want, uh, making you want more. So sin is not something that we can deal with on our own. Even the proverb writer said again uh, in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12, where it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Also in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, where uh, Jeremiah says, O Lord, the way of man is not his own. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. As we've just seen here, uh, listing these methods here. And so you may hear another method of, uh, a way man tries to uh, deal with sin himself. He may try to come up with alternative ways to get forgiveness, trying to do it his own way. And you've heard of this, you know, accept Jesus into your heart as your personal Savior and uh, say the sinner's prayer. 
and uh, you know, then you'll be saved. Well, you know, we we know we don't find that anywhere in the scriptures. Uh, I can just hear Jesus saying right now on the day of judgment, when some, if you know, a person coming up to Jesus said, well, I've accepted you into my heart as my personal Savior. I said the sinner's prayer. And I can just hear Jesus saying right now, where did I say that? The Bible clearly teaches if we continue being involved in sin, we will reap the consequences. Uh, Proverbs chapter 22 in verse 8, Proverbs 22, verse 8, it says, He who sows iniquity will reap sorrow. Also in Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 7, it says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, that he, will, uh, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap the flesh, reap correct, corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will reap, uh, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Uh, like I said, you know as, uh, what Jesus said in going to say on the day of judgment to those he does not know. He said, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's the one consequence we definitely do not want to hear. But there is an alternative to this. There is an alternative to sin and how we can uh, counter it. How we can counter its uh, destructive nature, its uh, addictive, uh, addic addictiveness, <laughs> if I can say that right. That remedy, you know, we all know, is Jesus. Jesus is the remedy for our sin. Uh, in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, uh, you know, it said there that Jesus said he had came to seek and to save that which is lost. And also in uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest and so we see where that rest is that rest from being enslaved from sin uh, which does so easily ensnare us in fact uh, Paul goes on to say in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 about that rest 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 Starting in verse 7, he says, And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction and from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And so if we want that rest and avoid... Uh, that vengeance, then we need to come to Jesus today if you hadn't already. And the way we do that, if you, by hearing this word here that we have, you know, that is preached from the scriptures, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and believing that word, believing Jesus is our way out of this world, uh, also repenting of our sins, we're not, no longer going to be uh, enslaved to it, we're not going to be addictive to it, we're going to put it away. And also confessing him before men and then also being baptized to wash us away of all that iniquity. And so we're going to offer that here this morning. If you are in that uh, boat right there, you know, we'd love to help you here this morning if you uh, are needing that remedy. But if you are also a Christian and you also need the prayers of the church to probably keep from falling into that, uh, if you... You know, if you are needing strength, we'd be glad to help you here in any way we can as we stand and sing. <laughs>